Good morning, LaSalle. The place where you can come as you are and, say it with me, stay where you are. Thank you. We continue to try different ways of being church. And, you know, it occurred to me this week that the Greek word for church, ekklesia, actually means assembly. It actually is talking about people physically, really, truly coming together. So uh, it's a challenge, isn't it, to be church when uh, in the very nature of the word, it's about being in the same room together. I'll tell you what, though, there is some weird intimacy happening online, um, holy intimacy. Uh, these uh, meetings that we've been doing, uh, early morning, 6.30, 4 o'clock, the holy uh, happy half hour, um, our 7 o'clock reflection, just some really cool stuff. So um, church, family, if you're interested in jumping in on any of that, I just really want to encourage you. Um, this week, of course, we begin Holy Week, and um, there's some neat stuff happening this week, Thursday and Friday. Both those services will be online in the context of a Zoom uh, platform, so details about that are on our website, and I really invite you to jump in on that. Easter culminates this week, next Sunday, uh, but Palm Sunday begins it. And um, today, with the time I have, I just want to frame really clearly what I think Jesus is doing in this Palm Sunday processional. Um, Jesus rides into Jerusalem, one of the last uh, actions of his life. This is the final week of his life, and I believe he is setting it up as a face-off as a showdown. This is the day when the powers collide, and we'll see it clearly in the cross, but we see it here in this triumphal march into Jerusalem. Jesus has spent every moment of his life trying to show us what it looks like to live free, to be free, and on this final week, he begins it with this incredible staged processional of telling the world, this is what freedom looks like. This, I believe, is a demonstration of street theater, a public play to remind everyone that follows, this is what it looks like for a free man to come in the way he does. So to be really clear, because I've got a couple of different points I need to make here, I want to say it really obviously on the front end. I believe Jesus rides in the way he rides in, unarmed, open, humble. And he rides in at the time he comes in, on the eve of a religious festival against a military processional, to publicly expose these powers that often go unexamined and unchecked to reveal to us in this vivid play-like form that we will never be liberated from the powers of domination by domination. That we will never be liberated from hate by hate. Jesus is giving his last energy, showing us how we can live free of those forces. I say this every year, and uh, I think I do, and if I say it every year, then at least I'm consistent, and you have to give that to me. Uh, because at the time that Jesus is entering Jerusalem from the East Gate, there is another processional going on, this one from the West Gate. While we heard about Jesus coming down from the Mountain of Olives, making his way to the city, there is another legion of soldiers coming in from the other direction. And this one would have been pomp and circumstance the whole way. It would have been Pontius Pilate at the beginning of a long stream of Roman soldiers. And they would have had stallions and weapons and all the hoopla of empire. They would have ridden in by the Caesar's gate. They weren't there to profess religious sympathies. Rome was there because they typically were there on all these Jewish festivals. They were there to show some muscle. They were there to show these good abiding Jews just who was boss. Some of you have seen this, this arch, this arch of Titus that now stands in Rome. If you were to look at that seriously, carefully, what you'd see inscribed on that arch 
is a processional, a Roman processional from when they were destroying Jerusalem in 70 AD. And they had taken the temple down to the ground and Roman forces had taken all the religious symbols of the, of the Jews and brought it back to Rome. And they memorialized that great processional with that Titus column. Now stay with me here because that destruction of that temple was in 70 AD, roughly 40 years after the time that Mark is recounting this scene of Jesus riding into Jerusalem. 40 years after the fact Jesus rides in, but in present day writing of Mark's gospel. When Mark is writing this gospel, that is going on. That temple destruction is what is ringing in his ears as he writes down this day of Jesus coming into Jerusalem. It was clear to Mark, writing decades later, exactly what Jesus was doing. And you can see it in the way Dan read that passage, Mark 11, verses 1 to 11. The first seven or eight verses is set direction. It's Jesus operating as a stage manager. It's Jesus cueing the actors, getting the props, telling them this is what's going to happen and this is what you're going to say to them. The action of Jesus actually riding into Jerusalem on the donkey, that takes all of just two verses. That is a quick moment. No, this is Jesus carefully choreographing. This is a planned production. Rome's stage direction had chariots, weapons, whips, armor. But for Jesus, this final campaign is just going to be him. Unarmed and undefended. He's got a donkey. He's got some palm branches. He's got a road littered with coats and cloaks. Picture that in your mind for a moment. The Son of Man, sitting tall on a donkey, riding through the narrow gate coming in from the east, receiving the praise of peasants waving sticks, branches, <laughs> all the while fully aware that across town there are legions of soldiers also processing, goose-stepping, marching with their swords and knives and hailing Caesar. This is Jesus satirizing, ridiculing, lampooning, the systems and institutions, the empire that thinks that they can control human existence. This is Jesus colliding with the machine. Well, how does that story from 30 AD, how does that story relate to us right now? Well, I've thought about domination a lot in these last few weeks. This virus has upended all the ways we think we control our lives, hasn't it? Half of the world is under a stay-at-home order. Th think about that. <laughs> Half of the globe is being told to stay inside. No one is immune from the chance of being a victim or a carrier of this virus. Everyone is subject to it, I heard New York Governor Andrew Cuomo say. It is, the virus is the great equalizer. I don't care how smart you are, how rich you are, how powerful you think you are, Cuomo said. That was just a few days before learning his own brother had the virus, right? I thought a lot about power and control, about authority, about command, how we grasp, how we seek to dominate. 
Some of that's in good ways, right? We've seen researchers and scientists and healthcare workers use all the arsenal they have to wrestle this virus to the ground. But in other ways, the forces of domination have been particularly ugly. We've seen images of people demanding their authority, standing on their rights, and distressingly, it's often come from people who should know better. Like this guy, that Florida uh, megachurch pastor who asserted his right to hold his church services in defiance of medical advice and common sense and public good. He urged his people to come into his church building because that was more important somehow than actually protecting them from potential infection. We've read of university presidents that have restarted classes, personally welcoming their students back to campus even as students have become carriers. We've seen Asian Americans experiencing the effect of rising hate crimes as leaders scapegoat them as a source of the virus. Domination techniques, violence of the empire techniques, all of these. But you know what occurred to me this week? That those are almost too easy of an example. They're almost straw man arguments of greedy pride and violence. They beg us to share them, to be outraged by them, because our own outrage can distract us from seeing the deeper temptation of domination and power. Because this is the insidious nature of evil, isn't it? <laughs> When we get outraged about those kind of crazy examples, those egregious things, we have little energy and little time left to actually look deeper. Jesus isn't just going against the poster child. He's also revealing the kind of dominating power that normalizes injustice and oppression simply by continuing and promoting the narrative that this is all normal. Let me show you what I mean, because Jesus wasn't coming into Jerusalem just to go against the empire, capital T, capital E. He wasn't only exposing the active power of domination and violence, he was also going to expose all the passive examples of it as well. We're going to see it at the end of the week, right? Pontius Pilate doesn't actively put Jesus on the cross, does he? No, in, in fact, he washes his hands of that, right? No, he, he puts Jesus on the cross by not putting up any real resistance to it. Here's how passive evil has been acting. The thing that, it, that we've been told that it somehow makes sense for us to put a price tag on the lives of the elderly, that some lives are simply worth more than others. That the loss of some jobs should be treated more meaningfully than the loss of other jobs. That somehow it's normal that gun stores be considered essential industries, as essential as medical clinics and grocery stores and pharmacies. See, this is the role of the passive evil, right? This is, this is a self-absorption kind of thing that, that, that prevents us from looking and naming what the heck is actually going on. This is that self-absorption piece that keeps some of us running around outside because we don't feel sick <laughs> without thinking that it's actually not about us. We might be making other people sick. In myself, it's the same self-focus that makes me reach for the last few cans of tomato sauce on a nearly bare store shelf 
without pausing and thinking, what the heck? I, I have a half dozen in cans in my own pantry. <laughs> but deeper, even deeper, deeper than the active forms of empire domination, the passive forms of complicity. Jesus is even going deeper than that. And that's why Mark's narrative is written like this. Jesus knows that there's a form of domination that goes deeper in the human heart, and he seeks to uncover that too. He forces us to acknowledge in this piece of street theater just how deeply we are held captive to the spirit of domination. The spirit of domination. You know what? Let me break this down for you because it is too darn easy to do, right? Let me break it down. The spirit of domination is that delicious thrill we get by putting our oppressors to shame. It is that intoxicating swig of revenge. It is the secret satisfaction of seeing wrongdoers get the divine punishment we know they deserve. Can I get an amen on that one from the sofa? See, this is why I think Mark is written the way it is. Stay with me here and look at it later. Because which of us would ever blame the people there that day who finally felt that their ship had come in? Their Savior had come. Now the boot of Rome was going to be off their back. This is why Mark's readers would have heard the description of Palm Sunday entry with greater and greater anticipation. Yes, Jesus is going against the Roman powers. Yes, he's fulfilling the great prophecy of Zechariah. Your king is coming to you. Yes, he's got a crowd of people with him. Mark draws all this symbolic, messianic action of expectation, and he rides Jesus into Jerusalem, and then nothing happens. Just as Tan read, he goes in, he looks around, he says, okay, back to Bethpage we go. It's Jesus yanking the curtain off the final, deep, insidious domination. We want a God who's going to put everybody finally, relentlessly in their place. Jesus won't have it. He's not going there. Sometimes when I read a post scoffing at the severity of the virus, deliberately pushing it even now, even now, as fake news. I have to say, I wonder, why doesn't God send this disease their way? You don't need to amen me on that one, okay? I've thought about my home state in the South, the unconscionable delay in quarantining, and I pause Wishing for what exactly? Accountability, yeah, for sure, at the minimum. But if I'm honest, I have wished for some sort of divine justice upon boneheaded decision makers. What is that? It is exactly the spirit of domination that Jesus is exposing asking me to see he is not going to have any part of that. Those prayers will go on to deaf ears. You know, I'm thinking that behind my need to dominate and control is fear. Back to what we said last week. Fear that is rampant, fear that is out of control, Fear that makes me think, if only I could control this. If only I could control others, my environment, their decision, these leaders, then things would be better. Do you feel that too? One LaSala wrote me this week. 
she says, I am so filled with fear right now. I am growing increasingly terrified of my workplace. In general, nursing homes all over the country are horribly ill-equipped to deal with and stop the spread of infection, and mine is among the bottom tier. We will certainly run out of PPE, personal protection equipment, and before the point when we're going to need it the most. I'm scared I'll bring infection in and kill dozens of people, and I'm scared that somebody else will bring it in and kill me. So like many other people, I'm seizing control in every possible way. I cannot begin to calculate how many times I have washed my hands today, how many things I have bleached, sprayed with Lysol, or boiled, and this was at home on a day off. Man, just speaking, just speaking that it may be fear undergirding our need to dominate is helpful, right? It's helpful for me anyway. Because I can remember that God doesn't play by our rule book. Not then and not now. This is a kingdom of invitational love Jesus is bringing. Jesus is going to die for giving those who have put him on the cross right up to the end. He's going to ask us to redirect our gaze to love. You know, this is the opportunity that's being offered us right now. Real freedom. Freedom beyond all of our judgment, right? Freedom beyond our outrage. Some of us have risen immediately to the challenge, and maybe it's who they are, maybe it's a function of their work. You know, I think of um, all these doctors, and as a good doctor friend of mine has told me, doctors have to get over their judgment immediately about the crazy things we patients do to ourselves. So doctors and therapists and nursing staff, they, they just get on with it, right? Others of us, let's just say Jesus has got some stuff to work with. Jesus knew that real freedom will begin by exposing our illusions and our false gods and our own thirst for power and judgment, but he also knew that it wasn't going to end with just exposing them. We have to be captivated by a more powerful love. And all the heartache of right now, that's the deeper invitation to learn how to love. Resilient love. Love beyond control. Love beyond proving others right. Love beyond retribution. Love beyond our fear. We're talking about resiliency, right? Courageous love. Creative love. The kind of love that will go right against the powers of evil. That's what we're being asked. You know, for the last few weeks, <clears throat> last week, there's been a group of us who have been committed to praying twice a day for the medical providers and the hospital chaplains here at LaSalle, those who are on the front lines of this virus. As you know, one of the cruelest conditions of the COVID-19 is that there's people dying alone. It's so contagious and staff is so bare bones that people die without a hand to hold. But look at this. This is what some chaplains out at Loyola uh, Hospital in Maywood are doing. They are standing at the door of patients' rooms Singing, singing loud enough for the dying to hear them. They are holding up iPads, showing the faces of loved ones, family members that can't be in the room. They're broadcasting their voices over the room intercom. They are using everything they have to stand there with the love of God to let people know you are not alone. 
Pastor Julie said that on Wednesday of this week, this past Wednesday, they delivered 25 meals to sequestered seniors. Three weeks ago, it was eight. And yes, that likely indicates a rising need, but also I suspect it indicates a certain lowering of defenses. Maybe a higher level of trust, right? A willingness to let others into that space. And then there's this too, and I'll close with this. This is a picture taken by one of LaSalle's nurses, Danielle Schroeder. She's a neonatal nurse. As Danielle was feeding a baby whose mother had abandoned her, this little girl, just a few pounds, reached out and held on to Danny's finger. It's almost like she knew that Danielle was a source of life. And she was going to hold on for all she had, with all she had, for all it was worth. We had an elder board meeting earlier this week. And one of our church leaders said that she was praying that right now we might begin to see this time as agonizing and as frightening as it is, not only as something to be gotten through, but also as a time that would be holy and sacred. A time for a deeper understanding, a deeper awareness of the presence of Jesus alongside us, ahead of us, behind us. A time to draw nearer, a time to share our faith, a time to be free from the forces that so often hold us captive. A time to hold on for dear life. Brothers and sisters, as we head into Holy Week, my prayer is that we'll do just that. That we will hold on to Jesus for dear life, that we will ask him to expose all the forces that even now continue to hold us captive and that we would lean in to this unguarded, undefended example of love. Would you join me in prayer? Gracious God, we seek to be free. We seek to live in the way that you lived. We seek to have on our own lips forgiveness for our enemies. We seek to live brave and courageous, and true. We ask, Holy Spirit, that as we journey with you on this last week, as we, we reflect on the stories of the last week of your life, the things you did, the conversations you had, the struggle that you went through, the deep trust that you continued to convey, I pray that you'd take us with us, that you would take us right alongside that we would not be far from your gaze. We ask that we would learn how to love, that we would learn the language of freedom. And we ask this, Jesus, in your name. And we all say, amen.